Thank you for viewing this Life to Tape video. Life to Tape is part of Fotations, and if you'd like to help, you can visit FotationsDonation.com, where there are ways you can support financially or by donating equipment. If you'd also like to support on social media, that helps out a lot. There's more information on our social media accounts in the links below. Thank you. So, we are going to be starting off with the Junior Classics. Uh, this is volume one, and it's Fairy and Wonder Tales, and I'm going to read the intro. The intro is kind of long, and like I said, this is the first time we're doing this live, and this is not only going to be uh, for the Twitch, uh, which is uh, Twitch TV slash Thumbs United, uh, but this is going to come out in podcast form. It is only coming out on podcast at 2.0 podcasting 2.0 compatible apps and websites and um, with podcasting 2.0 you can stream uh, bits which uh, you can stream satoshis which are the smallest unit of bitcoin as you listen so you can uh, with the podcasting 2.0 app you can set it to like oh i want to you know stream three Shato three satoshis you know a minute for every minute i uh I, you know, listen to this podcast, and that's like, you know, uh, maybe point uh, zero 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 uh, one cent a minute, but it helps, you know, everything helps. It's better than getting, you know, ad advertisement, which is, you know, always suspicious, uh, because a lot of times, uh, as a creator, it tells you, oh, you got this amount of uh, people viewing your videos, and we show them this much ad, but you only get this much, and it's like, well, that's, I had better numbers and uh, it's just not really accurate and it's not on the up and up and so paying uh, that way as you listen you know with the satoshis you know it helps me create more art and more uh, visual audiobooks and it uh, you know it just helps helps everyone and so uh, this is a podcasting 2.0 podcast and uh, I do record it live on Twitch and so we are reading the Junior Classics, Volume 1, Fairy and Wonder Tales. Now this introduction is going to be a little long, uh, but I thought it was important to read. And I do want to note that the Junior Classics is a very old uh, collection of of books. So there is some things that uh, might not be politically correct. In fact, I know there are things that are not politically correct, uh, but I've chosen to keep them in because I, I think it's important to have them there because you can kind of see uh, what people were thinking at the time of this book creation. And uh, I think it's important to see what they were not only thinking at that time, but to also see how far we've come uh, to today. And so I, I don't really like kind of erasing history because you don't really see the struggle that everyone had to go through at that time. Uh, to get to the point where we are today and uh, so and the other thing is it helps us you know not repeat the same mistakes and the same prejudices that uh, people had back in the day we can kind of see you know the error in the historical ways so let's get started the introduction the purpose of the Junior Classics is to provide 10 volumes containing about 5,000 pages, a classified collection of tales, stories, and poems, both ancient and modern, suitable for boys and girls from 6 to 16 years of age. Throughout parents and teachers who realize the evils of indiscriminate reading on the part of children will appreciate the educational value of such a collection. A child's taste in reading is formed as a rule in the first 10 to 12 years of its life, and experience has shown that the childish mind will prefer good literature to any others if access to it is made easy and will develop far better on literature to proven merit than on trivial transitionary material. The boy or girl who becomes familiar with the charming tales and poems in this collection will have gained knowledge of literature and history that will be of high value in other schools and homework. Here are the real elements of imaginative narrative, poetry, ethics, which should enter into the education of every English-speaking child. 
This collection carefully used by parents and teachers with due reference to individual tastes and needs will make many children enjoy good literature. It will inspire them with a love of good reading, which is the best possible result of any elementary education. The child himself should be encouraged to make his own selection from this large and varied collection, the child's enjoyment being the object in view, a real and lasting interest in literature or in scholarship, is only to be developed through the individual's enjoyment of his mental occupations. The most important change which has been made in American schools and colleges within my memory is the substitution from learning from driving of inspiration for drill, of personal interest and love of work to compulsion and fear. The schools are learning to use methods of materials which interest and attract the children themselves. The junior classics will put into the homes the means of using this happy method. Committing to memory beautiful pieces of literature, either prose or poetry, for, recita for recitation before a friendly audience, acting charades or plays, and reading aloud with fecosity and sympathetic emotion are good means of instruction at home or at school. This collection contains numerous admirable pieces of literature for such use in teaching in this collection contains numerous admirable pieces of literature for such use in teaching English and English literature. We should place more reliance upon processes and acts which awaken emotional and stimulate interest and prove to enjoyable for actors and the result in giving children the power of entertaining people and blessing others with noble pleasures with which the children create and share. From the home training during childhood, there should be a result in a child's taste and interest in improving reading which will direct and inspire its subsequent intellectual life. The training will result in a taste for good reading, however unsystematic or eccentric it may have been, has achieved one principal aim of education, and any school or home training which does not result in implanting this permanent taste has failed in every important respect. Guided and animated by this impulse to acquire knowledge and exercise the imagination through good reading, an adult will continue to educate himself throughout life. The story of the human race through all its slow development should be gradually conveyed to the child's mind from the time he begins to read or to listen to his mother's reading, and with description of facts and actual events should be mingled charmingly and uplifting products of imagination. To try to feed the minds of children upon facts alone is undesirable and unwise. The immense product of the imagination in art and literature is concrete fact which every educated human being should be made somewhat familiar, the product being a very real part of every individual's actual environment. The right selection of reading material for children is obviously high of high importance. Some of the mythologies, Old Testament stories, fairy tales, and historical romances on which earlier generations were accustomed to fed the children's minds contain a great deal of barbarous and perilous or cruel, and to this infiltration into the child's mind generation after generation of immoral, cruel, or foolish ideas is probably to be attributed in part the slow ethical process of the race. The common justification of this thoughtless practice is that children do not apprehend the evil and the bad mental pictures with which we foolishly supply them. But what should we think of a mother who gives her children dirty milk or porridge, or on that theory, that the children would not assimilate the dirt. Should we be less careful about the mental and moral food material? The junior classics have been selected with this principle in mind, without losing sight of the fact that every developing human needs to have a vision of the rough and thorny road over which the human race has slowly been advancing during thousands of years. Whoever has committed to this memory in childhood such Bible extracts as Genesis 1, the Ten Commandments, Psalms 23, Matthew 5, 8 through 12, Lord's Prayer, and Corinthians, Corinthians 13. Such English 
prose as Lincoln's Gettysburg Speech, Bacon's Essay on Truth, and such poems as Bryant's Waterfowl, Addison's Divine Ode, Milton's Sonnet of His Blindness, Walton's How Happy Is He Born and Taught, Emerson Rodeau's Holmes Chamberlain Natus, and Gray's Elegy has stamped them on has stamped them stamped on his brain by frequent rep repetition will have said in his mind high standards of noble thought and feeling true patriotism patriotism and pure religion he will have laid an invaluable store of good english while the majority of the tales and poems are intended for children who have begun to do their own reading there will be found in every volume sections fit for reading aloud to younger children throughout this collection the authors tell the stories of their own words, so that the salt of which gave them savor is preserved. There was some con consideration, however, such as any good teller of borrowed stories would make, but as rule of consideration has been applied only in the case of long works, which otherwise could not have been included. The notes which precede the, condens the condensation supply explanations, and answer questions which experience has shown boys and girls are apt to ask about the works condensed or their authors. The junior classic constitutes a set of books whose contents will delight children and at the same time satisfy the legitimate ethical requirements of those who have the children's best interest at heart. This was the introduction was written by Charles W. Elliot. Now we're going to start with the first story. You could see what I was talking about. It's a very long intro, uh, but I thought it was important to read uh, because it illustrated the importance of literature and the developing mind and how children kind of need, you know, they need stories and how much it influences uh, the life. And, you know, it really helps develop ethic, ethical norms and you know, hopefully it gives, you know, something for them to inspire, uh, to be, uh, when they grow up. So I got to find the, uh, okay, so the first story. There you go. The Indian Who Lost His Wife, retold by Andrew Lang. Once upon a time there was a man and his wife who lived in the forest far from the rest of the tribe. Very often they spent the day in hunting together, but after a while the wife found that she had so many things to do that she was obliged to stay home. So he went alone So he went alone through though he found that when his wife was not with him he never had any luck. One day when he was away hunting one day when he was away hunting the woman fell ill, and in a few days she died. Her husband grieved bitterly and buried her in the house where she had passed her life. But as the time went on, he felt so lonely without her that he made a wooden doll about her height and mid-size for company and dressed it in her clothes. He seated it in front of the fire and tried to think he had his wife back again. The next day he went out of the hut and when he came home, the first thing he did was to go up to the doll and brush off some of the lashes from, ashes from the fire which had fallen on its face. But he was very busy now, for he had to cook and mend. Besides getting food for, there was no one to help him. And so a whole year passed away. At the end of that time, he came back from hunting one night and found some wood by the door and a fire within. The next night there was only wood and there was not only wood and fire, but a piece of meat in the kettle, nearly ready for eating. He searched all about to see who could have done this, but could find no one. The next time he went to hunt, he took care not to go far and came in quite early, and while he was still a long way off, he saw a woman going into the house with wood on her shoulders. So he made haste and opened the door quickly, and instead of the wooden doll, his wife sat in front of the fire. Then she spoke to him and said, The great spirit felt sorry for you, because you would not be comforted. So he let me come back to you, but you must not stretch out your hand to touch me, till we have seen the rest of our people. 
If you do, I shall die. So the man listened to her words, and the woman dwelt there and brought the wood and kindled the fire, till one day her husband said to her, It's not it's now two years since you died. Let us now go back to our tribe. Then you will be well, and I can touch you. And with that he prepared the food and the journey, a sting of deer flesh for her to carry, and one for himself. And so they started. Now the camp of the tribe was a distant six-day journey, and when they were yet one day's journey off, it began to snow, and they felt weary and longed for rest. Therefore they made a fire and cooked some food, and spread out their skins to sleep. Then the heart of the man was greatly stirred, and he stretched his arm to his wife, but she waved her hand and said, We have seen no one yet, it's too soon. But he would not listen to her, and he caught her to him, and behold, he was clasping the wooden doll, and when he saw it, the doll, he pushed it from him in his misery and rushed away to the camp. He told them all his story, and some doubted, and they went back with him to the place where he and his wife had stopped to rest. There lay the doll, and beside they saw in the snow the steps of two people, and the foot of one was like the foot of a doll, and the man grieved sore all the days of his life. Kind of depressing story. A lot of the stories are if you just follow the rules, you know, everything will work out. So, the next story is Punchkin by E. Fairy. Once upon a time there was a Raja who had several beautiful daughters. They were all good girls, but the youngest named Bala was more clever than the rest. Raj's wife died when they were quite little children, so these seven poor princesses were left with no mother to take care of them. The Raja's daughter took it by turns to cook their father's dinner every day, while well, he was absent deliberating with his ministers on the affairs of the nation. About this time the Prudent died, leaving a widow of one daughter, and every day when the seven princesses were preparing their father's dinner, the Prudent's widow and daughter would come and beg for a little fire from the hearth. When Bala used to say to her sisters, Send that woman away, send her away, let her get the fire at her own house, what does she want with ours? If we allow her to come here, we shall suffer for it some day. But the other sisters would answer, Be quiet, Bala. Why must you always be quarreling with this poor woman? Let her take some of the fire if she likes. And the Prudent's widow used to go to the heath and take a few sticks from it, and while no one was looking, she would quickly throw some mud into the midst of the dishes which were being prepared for Raja's dinner. Now Raja was very fond of his daughters. Ever since their mother's death, they had cooked his dinner with their own hands, in order to avoid the danger of his being poisoned by his enemies. So when he found the mud mixed up with his dinner, she thought it must be rise from their careless carelessness, as it did not seem likely that anyone should have put mud on purpose. But being very kind, he did not like to reprove them for it although his spoiling of the curry was repeated many days. At last one day he determined he determined to hide and watch his daughter's cooking and see how it all happened. So he went into the next room and watched them through the hole in the wall. There he saw his seven daughters carefully washing the rice and preparing the curry, and as each dish was completed, they put it by the fire ready to be cooked. Next, he noticed the Prudence widow come to the door and beg for a few sticks from the fire to cook her dinner with. Bala turned her away angrily and said, Why don't you keep fuel in your own house and not come here every day to take ours? Sisters, don't give this woman any more wood. Let her buy it for herself. Then the eldest sister answered, Bala, let the poor woman take the wood and the fire. She does us no harm. But Bala replied, if you let her come here so often, maybe she will do us some harm, and make us sorry for it some day. The Raja then saw Prudian's widow go to the place where all the dinner was nicely prepared, and as she took the wood, she threw a little mud into each of the dishes. At this he was very angry, and sent to have the woman seized and brought before him. But when the widow came, she told him that she had played this trick because she wanted to gain an audience with him. 
With him she spoke so cleverly, and pleased him so well with her cunning words that instead of punishing her, the Raja married her and made her his Rene, and she and her daughters came to live. She and her daughter came to live in the pla palace. Now the new Rene. The new Rene hated the seven poor princesses and wanted to get them, if possible, out of the way, in order that her daughter might have all their riches and live in the palace as princess in their place. And instead of being grateful to them for their kindness to her, she did all she could to make them miserable. She gave them nothing but bread to eat, and very little of that, and very little water to drink, so these seven poor little princesses who had been accustomed to having everything comfortable about them and good food and good clothes all their lives long were very miserable and unhappy and they used to go out every day and sit by their dead mother's tomb and cry and say o oh, mother mother cannot you see your poor children how unhappy we are and how we are now we are starved by your cruel stepmother one day, while they were thus sobbing and crying, lo and behold, a beautiful palermo tree grew up out of the grave, covered with fresh ripe palonos, and the children satisfied their hunger by eating some of the fruit, and every day after, instead of trying to eat the bad dinner their stepmother provided for them, they used to go out to their mother's grave and eat palmeros, which grew there on the beautiful tree. Then the Renée said to her daughter, I cannot tell how it is. Every day those seven girls say they won't want any dinner and won't eat any, and yet they never grow thin or look ill. They look better than you do. I cannot tell how it is. And she bade her watch the seven princesses and see if any one gave her anything to eat. So the next day when the princesses went to their mother's grave and were eating the beautiful palmeros, the Puda's daughter followed them and saw them gathering the fruit. Then Balina said to her sisters, Do you not see that girl watching us? Let us drive her away, or hide the palmeros, else she will go and tell her mother all about it, and that will be bad for us. But the other sisters said, Oh no, do not be unkind, Bala. The girls would never the girl would never be so cruel as to tell her mother. Let us rather invite her to come and have some of the fruit. And calling her to them they gave her one of the palmeros. No sooner had she eaten it, however, than the Puna's daughter went home and said to her mother, I do not wonder the seven princesses will not eat the dinner you prepare for them, for by their mother's grave there grows a beautiful pomero tree, and there go and they go there every day and eat the pomeros. I ate one, and it was the nicest I had ever tasted. The cruel Renée, which was much vexed at hearing this, and all the next day stayed in her room and told Raja that she had a very bad headache. The Raja was very, Raja was deeply grieved and said to his wife, What can I do for you? She answered, There is only one thing that will make my headache well. By your dead wife's tomb there grows a fine pomero tree. You must bring me that here and boil it, root and branch, and put a little of water in which it has been boiled on my forehead, and that will cruel cure my headache. So the Raja sent his servants and had the beautiful palmero tree pulled up by the roots, and he did as the Rene did as the Rene desired, and when some of the water in which it had been boiled was put on her forehead, she said her headache was gone, and she felt quite well. The next day the seven princesses went as usual to the grave of their mother, the palmero tree had disappeared, and then they all began to cry very bitterly. Now there was by the Renée's tomb a small tank, and as they were crying they saw the tank was filled with a rich cream-like substance, which quickly hardened into thick white cake. As seen this, all the princesses were very glad, and they ate some of the cake and liked it. The next day the same thing happened, and so it went on for the next many days. Every morning the princesses went to their mother's grave and found the little tank filled with the nourishing cream-like cake. Then the cruel stepmother said to her daughter, I cannot tell how it is. I have had the palmero tree, which used to grow by the, Rene by the Renée's grave, destroyed. And yet the princesses grow no thinner, nor look more sad. Though they never eat dinner, I give them. I cannot tell how it is. And her daughter sighed, I will watch. 
Next, the next day, the princesses were eating the cream cake. Who should come by but their stepmother's daughter? Belina saw her first and said, See, sisters, there, she, there comes that girl again. Let us sit around the edge of the tank and not allow her to see it. For if we give her some of our cake, she will go and tell her mother, and that will be very unfortunate for us. The other sisters, however, thought Bala was unnecessarily suspicious, and instead of following her advice, they gave the Puna's daughter some of the cake, and she went home and told her mother all about it. The Rene, on hearing how well the princesses fared, was exceedingly angry, and sent her servants to pull down the dead Rene's tomb and fill the tank with the ruins, and not content with this, the next day pretended to be very ill, in fact, at the point of death and when the Raja was much grieved, and asked her whether it was in his power to produce any, produce her any remedy, she said to him, Only one thing can save my life, but I know you will not do it, he replied. She replied, Yes, whatever it is, I will do it. She then said, To save my life, you must kill the seven daughters of your first wife, and put some of their blood on my forehead, and all and the palms of my hands, and their death will be my life. At these words the Raja was very sorrowful, but because he feared to break his word, he went out of his, went out with a heavy heart to find his daughters. He found them crying by the ruins of their mother's grave. Then, feeling he could not kill them, the Raja spoke kindly to them, and told them to come out into the jungle with him, and there he made a fire and cooked some rice, and gave it to them. But in the afternoon, it being very hot, the seven princesses fell asleep, and when he saw they were fast asleep, the Raja, their father, stole away and left them, for he feared his wife, saying to himself, It is better the poor daughters should die here than be killed by their stepmother. He then shot a deer, and returning home, put some of its blood on the forehead, the, on the forehead and his hands of the Renee, and she thought that it was... They, and she thought that she thought then that he had really killed the princesses and said she felt quite well. Meantime, the seven princesses awoke, and when they found themselves all alone in the thick jungle, they were much frightened and began to call out as loud as they could in hopes of making their father hear. But as they, but as time went far away, and would not have been able to hear them, even had their voices been as loud as thunder. It so happened that this very day the seven young sons of the neighboring Raja chanced to be hunting in that same jungle, and as they were returning home, after the day's sport was over, the youngest prince said to his brothers, Stop! I think I will hear someone crying and calling out. Do you not hear voices? Let us go in the direction of that sound and find out what it is. So the seven princesses rode, seven princes rode through the woods until they came to the place where the seven princesses sat crying and wringing their hands. At the sight of them, the young princes were very much astonished, and still more so on learning their story. And they settled that each should take one of these poor forlorn ladies home with him and marry her. So the first eldest prince took the eldest princess home with him and married her, and the second took the second, and the third took the third, the fourth took the fourth, and the fifth took the fifth, the sixth took the sixth, and the seventh, and the handsomest of all took the beautiful Bala. And when they got to their own land, there was a great rejoicing throughout the kingdom at the marriage of the seven young princes to seven such beautiful princesses. About a year after this Bala held about a year after this, Bala had a little son, and his uncles and aunts were so fond of the boy that it was as if he had seven fathers and seven mothers. None of the other princesses and none of the other princes and princesses had any children, so the son of the seventh prince and Bala was acknowledged as their heir by all the rest. They had thus lived a very happy. They had thus lived very happily for some time. When one fine day the seventh prince, seventh prince Bala's husband, said he would go out hunting, and went away, and then wait, they waited a long time for him, but he never came back. Then his six brothers said they would go and see what had become of him, and they went away, but also did not return. 
the seven princesses grieved very much, for they feared that their kind husbands must have been killed. One day, not long after this happened, Bala was rocking her baby's cradle, and while her sisters were working in the room below, there came to the palace door a man in a long black dress, who said he was Falkir, and came to beg. The servants told him, You cannot go into the palace of Raja's sons, have all gone away. We think they must be dead, and their widows cannot be interrupted by your begging. But he said, I am a holy man, you must let me in. Then the stupid servants let him walk through the palace, but they did not know that this was no fakir, but a wicked magician named Punchkin. Punchkin Fakir was wander was a wandered through the palace and saw many beautiful things there, till at last he reached the room where Bala sat, singing beside her little boy's cradle. The magician thought her more beautiful than all the other beautiful things he had seen, insomuch that he asked her to go home with him and to marry him, but she said, My husband, I fear, is dead, but my little boy is still quite young. I will stay here and teach him to grow up a clever man, and when he is grown up, he shall go out into the world and try to learn tidings of his father. Heaven forbid that I should ever leave him or marry Jan. At these words the magician was very angry, and turned her into a little black dog, and led her away, saying, Since Jan will not come with me of your own free will, I will make you. So the, so, so the poor princess was dragged away without any power of effecting an escape, or of letting her sisters know what had become of her. As Punchkin passed through the palace gate, the servant said to him, Where did you get that pretty little dog? And he answered, One of the princesses gave it to me as a present, at hearing which they let him go without further questioning. Soon after this, the six elder princesses heard the little baby, their nephew, begin to cry, and when they went upstairs, they were much surprised to find him all alone, and Bal is nowhere to be seen. Then they questioned the servants, and when they heard of the Falkir and the little black dog, they guessed what had happened, and sent in every direction seeking them, but neither the Falkir nor the dog were to be found. What six poor what could six poor women do? They gave up all hopes of ever seeing their kind husbands and their sister and their husband and her husband again, and devoted themselves th thenceforth to teaching and talking, taking care of their little nephew. Thus time went on till Bala's son was fourteen years old. Then one day his aunt told him the history of the family, and no sooner did he hear it that he was bes that he was seized with the great desire to go in search of his father and mother and uncles, and if he, he could not find them alive, to bring them home again. His aunts, on learning this determination, were much alarmed at the tried, and tried to dissuade him, saying, We have lost our husbands and our sister and her husband, and you are now our sole hope. If you go away, what shall we do? But he replied, I, pay, I pray you not be discouraged. I will return soon, and if it is possible, bring my father and mother and my uncles with me. And so he set out on his travels, but for some months he could learn nothing to help him in his search. At last, after he had journeyed many thousand, many hundreds of weary miles, and became almost hopeless of ever hearing anything further of his parents, he one day came to a country that seemed full of stones and rocks and trees, and there he saw a large palace with a tower hard by was a mali's little house as he was looking about the mali's wife saw him and ran out of the house and said my dear boy who are you that dare venture to this dangerous place he answered i am a rajah's son and i come here in search of my father and my uncles and my mother whom a wicked enchanter bewitched then the mali wife said, This country and this place belong to a great enchanter. He is all-powerful, and if anyone displeases him, he can turn them into stones and trees. All the rocks and trees you see here were living people once, and the magician turned them to what they are now. Some time ago a Raja's son came here, and shortly afterward came his six brothers, and they were all turned into stone and trees, and these are not the only unfortunate ones. For up in that tower lives a most beautiful princess, 
whom the magician has kept prisoner there for twelve years, because she hates him and will not marry him. Then the little prince thought, This must be my parents and my uncles. I have found what I seek at last. So he told his story to the Mali's wife, and begged her to help him help to remain in that place a while and inquire further concerning the unhappy people she had mentioned, and she promised to befriend him, and advised his dis and advised he his disguise himself at least the magician should see him and turn him likewise into stone to this the prince agreed so that meli's wife dressed him up in a sarif and pretended he was her daughter one day not long after this the magician was walking in his garden he saw the little girl as he thought playing about and asked her who she was she told him that he was meli's daughter and the magician said you are a pretty little girl and tomorrow you shall take a present of flowers from me to the beautiful lady who lives in the tower. The young prince was much delighted at hearing this, and went immediately to inform the Malie's wife, inform the Malie's wife, after consulting with whom he determined that it would be more safe for him to go it would be more safe for him to retain his disguise and trust to the chance of a favorable opportunity for establishing some communication with his mother, if it were indeed she. Now it happened that Belena's marriage, her husband, had given her a small gold ring on which her name was engraved, and she put it on her little son's finger when he was a baby, and afterwards when he was older his aunts had it enlarged for him, so he was still able to wear it. The Malie's wife advised him to fasten the well-known treasure to one of his bonnets he presented to his mother and trusted to her to recognize it this was not to be done without difficulty as such a strict watch was kept over the poor princess for fear of her ever establishing communication with her friends that thought supposed that though the supposed Mali's daughter was permitted to take the flowers every day the magician or one of his slaves always in the room at the time now last one day however the opportunity favored him and when no one was looking the boy tied the ring to a nosegay and threw it at belena's feet it fell with a clang on the floor and belena looking to see what made the strange sound found a little ring tied to the flowers on recognizing she at once believed the story her son told her of his long search and begged him to advise her as to what she had better do at the same time in tra at the same time entreating him to no account to endanger his life by trying to rescue her she told him that for twelve long years the magician had kept her shut up in the tower because she refused to marry him and she was so closely guarded that she saw no hope of release now belinda's son was a bright clever boy so he said, Do not fear, dear mother. The first thing to do is to discover how far the magician's power extends, in order that we may be able to liberate my fathers and uncles, whom he has imprisoned in the form of rocks and trees. You have spoken to him angrily for twelve long years. Now rather speak kindly. Tell him you have given up all hopes of again seeing your husband you have so long mourned, and say you are willing to marry him. The endeavor will find out then endeavor to find out what his power consists in, and whether he is immortal or can be put to death. Belina determined to take her son's advice, and the next day sent for Punchkin, and spoke to him as had been suggested. The magician, greatly delighted, begged her to allow the wedding to take place as soon as possible, but she told him that before she must, before she married him, he must allow her a little more time in which he might make his acquaintance, and that, after being enemy so long, their friendship could but strengthen by degrees. And do tell me, she said, are you quite immortal? Can death ever touch you? And are you too great an enchanter ever to feel human suffering? Why do you ask, said he? Because, she replied, if I am to be your wife, I would fain to know all about you, in order, if any calamity threatens you, to overcome, or if possible, to avert it. It is true, he added, that I am not as others far, far away, 
hundreds of thousands of miles away from this there lies a desolate country covered with a thick jungle in the midst uh, and in the midst of the jungle grows a circle of palm trees and in the center of the circle stand six chatters full of water piled one above the other below the six chatty chanty is a small cage which contains a little green parrot on the life of this parrot depends my life and if the parrot is killed i must die it is however he added impossible that the parrot should sustain any injury both on the account of inaccessibility of the country and because by my appointment many thousands of genies surround the palm trees and kill all who approach the place valerie told her son what punchkin had said but all at the same time implored him to give up all idea of getting the parrot the prince however replied mother unless i can get a hold of that parrot you and my father and uncles cannot be liberated be not afraid i will shortly return do you meantime keep the magician in good humour still putting off your marriage with him on various pretexts and before he finds out the cause of the delay i will be here so saying he went away many many weary miles did he travel till at last he came to a thick jungle and being very tired sat down under a tree and fell asleep he was awakened by a soft rustling sound and looking about him saw a large serpent which was making its way to an eagle's nest built into the tree under which he lay and in the nest there were two young eagles the prince seeing the danger of the young birds drew his sword and killed the serpent at the same moment the rushing sound was heard in the air and the two old eagles which had been out hunting food for their young ones returned they quickly saw the dead serpent and the young prince standing over it and the old mother eagle said to him dear boy for many years all our young ones have been devoured by that cruel serpent you have now saved the lives of our children whenever you are in need there is therefore send for us and we will help you as for your these little eagles take them and let them be your servants at this the prince was very glad and the two eagles crossed their wings on which the mount on which he mounted and they carried him far far over the thick jungle until he came to the place where grew the circle of palm trees in the midst of which stood the six chanties full of water it was the middle of the day and the heat was very great all around the trees were the genies fast asleep nevertheless there was much countless thousands of them that it would have been quite impossible for any one to walk through the ranks to the palace down swooped the strong-winged eagle at down jumped the prince in an instant he had overthrown the six hanties full of water and seized the little green parrot which he rolled up in his cloak while he mounted again into the air all the genies below awoke finding their treasure gone set up a wild and melancholy, melancholy howl away away flew the little eagles till they came to their home in the great tree then the prince said to the old eagle take back your little ones they have done me good service if i ever again stand in need of help i will not fail to come to you he then continued his journey on foot till he arrived once more at the magician's palace where he sat down at the door and began playing with the parrot punchkin saw him and came to him quickly and said my boy where did you get yon parrot give it to me i pray you but the prince answered oh no i cannot give away my parrot it is a great pet of mine i have had it many years then the magician said if it is an old favorite i can understand you not caring to give it away but what will come but come what will you sell for it sir said the prince i will not sell my parrot then punchkin got frightened and said anything anything name the, what price you will and let it and it shall be yours the prince answered let seven rajah's sons whom you turned into stones and trees be instantly liberated it is done as you desire the magician only give me my parrot and with that by a stroke of his wand while his husband and his brothers resumed their natural shapes now give me my parrot repeated punchkin not so fast my master rejoined the prince i must first beg you that you restore all life all whom you have thus imprisoned the magician immediately waved his hand again and whilst he cried in an imploring voice give me my parrot the whole garden began suddenly 
became so suddenly alive where rocks and stones and trees had been before stood rajas and prunts and sidars and mighty men on prancing horses and jeweled pages and troops of armed attendants give me my parrot cried punchkin then the boy took a hold of the parrot and tore off one of the wings and as he did so the magician's right arm fell off punchkin then stretched out his left arm crying give me my parrot the prince pulled off the parrot's second wing and the magician's left arm tumbled off give me my parrot he cried and fell on his knees the prince pulled off the parrot's right leg and the magician's right leg fell off the prince pulled off the parrot's left leg and down fell the magician's left nothing remained of him save the limbless body and the head but still he rolled his eyes and cried give me my parrot take your parrot then cried the boy and with that he wrung the bird's neck and threw it at the magician and he and as he did so punchkin's head twisted around and with a fearful groan he died then they let balina out of the tower and he her son and the seven princes went down went to their own country and lived happily ever afterwards and as to the rest of the world every one went to his own house So that's it for this episode of the Live to Tape, uh, the Flotations Live to Tape podcast. Uh, this comes out on Fridays. I'm also doing a video release, and with the video release, it comes to YouTube and my website, Flotations. And it's a multi format video release uh, because I filmed these time-lapse photography videos. I call them drive-lapse, where I'm driving across the United States. And I actually filmed it in 3D. And so I release it for a VR, for 3D TVs, and then uh, embedded 3D. And so the VR is a stereograph, which is like the old-fashioned 3D viewers uh, that you can just put your cell phone in, and then you can view the 3D video that way. The 3D for TVs is the side-by-side -side method uh, which uh, you would have to load into YouTube and then manually set your TV into the 3D mode if you still have a 3D TV. I still believe 3D is going to come back because it always does uh, and in some ways it already has come back in the form of VR. And so with the VR, if you have PlayStation VR, if you have an Oculus, uh, even an Oculus Go, an Oculus Quest, uh, anywhere you can run the YouTube VR app uh, with the embedded 3D, it will automatically be played back in 3D when you use the 3D uh, YouTube app. So you can subscribe to Live to Tape on YouTube. Thank you for viewing this Live to Tape video. Live to Tape is part of Fotations, and if you'd like to help, you can visit FotationsDonation.com, where there are ways you can support financially or by donating equipment. If you'd also like to support on social media, that helps out a lot. There's more information on our social media accounts in the links below. Thank you.